As Corita was reading his orders from Toyota, patrol planes from the American carriers were already heading for the position radioed by Darter. At 7.46, they were signaling that they had sighted the enemy battleship force rounding the southern tip of Mindoro. In the dimly lit plot of the American battleship New Jersey, Halsey was making his dispositions to fight the tremendous battle that was now looming. Halsey spoke over the hissing loudspeakers in a hundred warships. Strike, repeat, strike, good luck. All of a sudden, emergency flight quarters was sounded on the, on the communication system and I knew what had happened. We'd located the Japanese forces. So we manned the ready room and manned our airplanes and we knew this was going to be a long one. Barely half an hour after air patrols sighted Corita's force making for the San Bernardino Strait, the radio circuits were crackling again with the news that another group of battleships had been spotted 300 miles to the south. They were the second arm of the enemy force sent to attack Leyte. Admiral Davison's Task Group 38.4 was ordered to launch a strike against them since his carriers were the closest to Leyte. The glowing panel of the New Jersey's main battle plot was now marked with all the Japanese dispositions except for the enemy carriers. Halsey did not know that his air patrols failed to reach far enough north to find Admiral Ozawa, who was waiting to be discovered as the bait to lure the Third Fleet away from Leyte Gulf. The hunt was in full swing when the Japanese found the northernmost of Halsey's units. Shortly after 9 a.m., Admiral Frederick Sherman's Task Group 3 came under heavy attack by the first wave of enemy aircraft from the Luzon airfields. Combat air patrols directed from the carrier Essex broke up their formations, but the fighters and the heavy barrage of anti-aircraft fire did not stop a Japanese bomber from punching through to crash into the Princeton, hitting squarely on the flight deck. Its 100-pound bomb plowed through the hangar, setting off a tumultuous blaze. When I saw a suicide attack for the first time, I was very shocked. A fighter who was caught in the anti-aircraft fire made a body attack on the enemy's carrier. I felt how brave he is. Congratulations. But at the same time, I felt, was there any way to help him? So many different feelings came to mind. The cruiser Birmingham was sent alongside to assist in the firefighting. The Princeton got hit, so they abandoned ship. USS Cass and Young picked them up. We had air attacks all day. Then they called us to come alongside and fight the fire. So we were tied up alongside of the Princeton. Princeton was on our starboard side. And we thought we had to fire out. And the uh, commander of Task Force 58 said, uh, we should take it in tow. So I had just left the starboard side went back to get ready. A guy by the name of, he was another boatswain mate, Mahoney. We s said we could handle it, so we were getting ready to take her in tow. Man, all at once we heard this explosion, and I thought it was another kamikaze. The fire had reignited and reached down into the bomb magazines. The blast blew her stern off. Alongside, the Birmingham was caught up in the detonation. It blasted her superstructure, killing 200 crewmen. There's people laying all around, legs off, arms off, big chunks of steel in them. This one guy, Pedro Medlin, is laying there with his leg off. He asked me to give him a shot of morphine. I did. 
and uh, I guess he was in shock. He said, uh, Striegel, give me another shot of, give me a shot of morphine. I said, Pedro, I just did. You marked a big X on their forehead. He said, no, you didn't. You don't want to help me. That hurt. If I gave him another shot, he'd have died. The Princeton remained a floating inferno throughout the afternoon until she was dispatched by American torpedoes that evening. 